Welcome, uh, Chair, welcome back. Um, Mindy, welcome. Vahid, welcome. We're waiting to hit critical mass, so we'll probably give a couple more minutes um, for folks to make their way in the room and joining us virtually, and then we'll get started. So give us a couple more minutes to get, get going. For, for those that are joining online virtually, if uh, you do want to identify by raising your hand, we are going to have public comment towards the beginning of the agenda. Um, but if you want to get in the queue now, feel free. I'll make another ask um, a little after the hour. Thanks. Well, now we can get going. No, you can go whenever you want. No, we were waiting to hit critical mass. I was seeing if Ebony, I don't see Ebony quite yet. We'll give her another, another minute and then we'll get going. My apologies for my tardiness, Ben. <laughs> right on time. So, I see the... Uh, Slide. Should I be seeing the uh, room? Um, I don't know that we're showing the room yet. I can... Okay. I just want to make sure I'm actually on. You are. I can hear you and see you, Matt. Okay. Great. Um, let's see. Hey, Tootie. Yes. I had to uh, pause our business meeting yesterday for the first time ever. We had a big audience protest on one of our, on our uh, Safe Rest pod. Oh, no. That is really about one particular site. So, yeah, I was channeling your bravery. We have had so many of those. It's been astounding. You but know, we, you, have, we have 500 people. So you're sharing that taught me. So thank you. Well, good. I tell you, um, and you know, you have the legal right to conduct the meeting as you see fit. According to my county council, you also have the legal right not to accept public testimony. That is not a law. That is a gift that we <laughs> as leaders confer on the electorate. And we get a lot of issues at Clackamas County because the legislature's closed. And when the legislature's not in open, not in session, we get all their stuff. We say, well, that's a legislative issue. So we get a lot of complaints, just people venting. Mm. But but that's what my county council tells me. So you might want to confer with your own county council. 
There we go. Well, the inner inner workings of uh, of local government decision making. Recording in progress. Um, th thank you, chairs, for being uh, illuminating the behind the scenes. So why don't we get started? We're at uh, four oh five. Uh, we'll welcome folks as they as they come in. So welcome to the Tri County Planning Body meeting, June fourteenth, twenty twenty three. I'm Ben Duncan, uh, facilitating today. We're going to start with some introductions. And if I can go with our members online and then we'll work our way into the room, uh, I'll just go in the order that I see you. So Chair Harrington, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Catherine Harrington. I'm the elected chair of the Washington County Board of Commissioners. I'm sorry, I'm not up for Washington County in case I didn't say that. I have to apologize in advance. I'm just back from a uh, a trip to Southeast Asia for work. Just got back uh, Sunday afternoon. So I'm dealing both with a head cold and with jet lag, which is why I'm not there with you in the room today uh, because I still don't have confidence that my stamina will last long enough into the day for me to drive safely. So. Well, we'll give you grace if you if you just nod off in the middle of the meeting, but we'll try to keep it energizing enough uh, so that doesn't happen. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of our co-chairs, Matt Chapman, please. Uh, sure, <clears throat> Matt Chapman. He is uh, co-chair of the uh, of the body and uh, uh, volunteer, retired and all that. And I'm normally uh, able to attend the meeting, but um, in in consideration of the fact that I don't have a Southeast Asia excuse. But uh, somehow or other, in this area, I, I caught something a few days ago. I think I'm over it, but I did not want to share germs with everybody. That seemed potentially rude. So I am online today. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate you not sharing your germs with us. Chair Smith, please. Uh, uh, Trudy Smith, Chair of Clackamas County Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mindy? Hi, Mindy Statlander, Interim CEO for Health Chair of Oregon. Happy to be here. Thanks for being here, Yvette. Hi, all. I'm Yvette Hernandez. Um, I work for Home Forward, but I am participating as a community member, and I usually participate online. Great. Thank you, Yvette. Uh, Christina. Uh, hi, everyone. Christina Palacios, she, her pronouns. I'm uh, participating as a community member. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Nicole Larson, she, her pronouns. I am a city liaison for Mago Day Community and a licensed clinical social worker. Good to be with you all. Thank you. So we'll circle back to some of our other folks. Let's go into the room, Steve. Steve Rudman, he, him, member. Thank you. Commissioner Jayapal. Good afternoon, everyone. I don't think, is it on? No, I can't tell either. They need the lights brighter. Technical. We hear you. We can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Sushila Jayapal, Multnomah County Commissioner, she, her pronouns. Um, I may sound as if I have germs, but it's allergies, so I just want to reassure you. <laughs> okay, thanks for the clarification. <laughs> uh, Councillor Lewis. Christine Lewis, Metro Council District 2, and delighted to be here in person, I think, for the first time after months of computer participation. And then this is McCall. Yes, our, one of our most active uh, uh, honorary videos. members. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see, Mercedes. Hello, everybody. Mercedes Salisale, she and her pronouns. I'm the director of advocacy at Latino Network. Thank you, Zoe. Okay. Working? Yes. Yes. Yay. Soy Copiano. Soy la Copiano. Uh, she, her, ella. And I'm um, here from a nonprofit, Community Action, Washington County. First time in person. And very nice to meet you. Oh. It's a whole Thanks. new world in person. So right. <laughs> well, Room looks small. It's good to have you here. Monta, please. Uh, Monta Knudsen, he, him pronouns. I'm the CEO over at Bridges to Change. Great, thank you. So if we can hit some staff. Uh, Ariella, you want to introduce yourself as my co-pilot here? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ariella Dolan. I'm with Kearns and West, and I'll be developing the meeting summary today. Thank you. Abby? I'm Abby Ahern. I use she, her pronouns. I work for the Metro on the TCPB staff. Thank you. Liam? Liam Frost. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm the Assistant Director of Housing at Metro, and I just want to say that 
it really feels like hybrid is working here. We have a rotating cast of characters. I don't want anybody at home feeling bad that they're at home. Uh, we've got plenty of good people in the room, and I'm sure people are going to take turns. So it feels like it's working. Well, so let's keep it working. Uh, Malia. Or Valeria, sorry, I skipped right over you. No worries. Hi, Valeria McWilliam, say she, her pronouns, and I work for the um, Metro Housing Department. Malia Dieter, she, her pronouns, program assistant for Metro Housing. Great. And Patricia, online? Good afternoon, Patricia Rojas, she, her, a, uh, pronouns, and I'm the Regional Housing Director for Metro. Glad to be here with you all. Great. And then we have a, a number of folks that are going to be presenters. So um, for our county folks, I'll have you introduce yourself, if that's okay, when you come on. And for our other guests, uh, they're going to talk about landlord mitigation. We'll have you do an introduction when you present, if that works. Okay. So let's, um, can we pull slides up? We'll uh, review the agenda. And then, Matt, uh, I don't see Ebony here, so you'll be uh, holding the duties to approve our meeting summary. But let's walk through the agenda really quickly. We have... <laughs> Um, we'll, we'll create some space for public comments. So if there are folks who are um, either joining live in person, uh, we have blue cards. You can sign up for public comment. Those online, please raise your hand and we'll get you in the queue um, after we approve our meeting summary. We're going to hear staff updates, uh, starting with uh, um, Liam to give us an update on uh, kind of progress uh, made around goals and recommendations. And really building from that conversation, we'll have some presentations from our county staff as well as some guests uh, that are going to talk about landlord uh, mitigation efforts. Uh, is that what it's called? Did I say that right? Yeah. Landlord liaisons, landlord risk mitigation. Thank you. Um, uh, and, and we'll create some time for, for Q&A after that. And then we'll close our conversation with a follow-up and request that came from uh, Tri-County Planning Body members around the, the development and of, uh, of an equity lens, um, which was a request to staff to, to come back to this group. So we'll get a little bit of hands-on activity in small groups um, and, and provide a chance for you all to give feedback. Um, we'll do some closing next steps and we'll get out of here at six o'clock. So any questions on the agenda? None in the room, none online. Okay, great. So Matt, can I pass it to you to uh, um, lead us through the approval sure. of the May meeting summary? Yeah, um, so everyone got the uh, meeting summary last Wednesday. Uh, certainly looked good to me, so I will move adoption of that. Uh, and if there's a second and uh, enough people vote, we're done with that issue. Great, so Matt has made a motion to approve the May meeting summary. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Jayapal. All those in favor, raise hand, say aye. One or the other. All right. Is there any opposed or abstention? Not hearing any. Meeting summary is uh, approved. Um, so now is the time I want to. Oh, oh, Mike, welcome. Can you introduce yourself? You joined, I think, since we've done introductions. Hi, sorry I'm late. Uh, Mike Lou, Food One Shopping Center. Great, thank you for being here. Um, so let's move into, uh, we have uh, some time allocated for public comment. So this is a chance for members of the public to provide input to the Tri-County Planning Body. Um, if folks are interested, you have up to three minutes to uh, provide your public comment. It's not a space for deliberation, but certainly anything that's brought forward um, can uh, be considered by the Tri-County Planning Body. So if there are folks in the audience, please raise your hand. I don't think we see anybody on the phone. And I do confirm we didn't get written public comment, correct? Yes. So again, anyone who's on the phone, you can um, click the raise hand button. If you, depending on what your screen looks like, you click on the ellipses that says more and it gives you an option. Last call. Not seeing any public comment. We will move to staff updates. Liam, I'm gonna start with you. Thank you, Ben. I'm gonna be, uh pretty brief here and provide a couple of updates and then hand it over to Valeria McWilliams and my team. Uh, but before I do, I just wanted to um, acknowledge uh, what, Chair Harrington, uh, what Chair Harrington referenced uh, before the meeting began, and that was um, uh, she had a, I don't know what the technical term is, Chair, but I had to pause the um, 
the proceedings yesterday, Washington Board of uh, Commissioners. And I was there because I was attending with Susan Emmons, the, one of the co-chairs of the Oversight Committee and Nui Bazaar and our team. And we had to reschedule because that room was very vociferous, um, a lot of resistance in there to, um, I, I know the item wasn't about shelter siting, it was about purchasing of pods. But Jess Larson reminded me at the time to take a look and say, and to say to us, this is how difficult it is to do shelter. This is every time we want to do shelter, this is what happens. And it's a good reminder for folks who are on the outside saying, why didn't you just put up more shelters? Well, it's really, really hard. So thank you for that reminder, Jess. And um, kudos to you uh, yesterday moving through that, uh, Chair Harrington. Um, just a quick update on some of the pieces here. One, we have one contract in the field right now pursuing the landlord recruitment goal. Um, Abby and Valeria are interviewing um, other consultants right now. Um, I do want to provide a very brief update on our work with uh, HealthShare and uh, trying to find ways to coordinate and integrate some of that work in the healthcare sector with homeless uh, services uh, for the first time um, in ever. And I can say, and I think Jess would affirm, and others who have been in that room, that we are making really good progress. Um, I think the, the key to it so far is the culture that we've created. Um, I want to give um, a lot of kudos to Mindy and your team, especially Alyssa and Christina Mindy, who are showing up um, with Grace and wanting to work together. Um, we're also working uh, with the governor's office and letting them know that we are embarking on this project together so that we are able to do things in tandem uh, before they provide guidance on the Medicaid waiver. And so uh, just to share that with you all today. Um, the next update I have is kind of dovetailing my third update. And so on the technical assistance front, uh, Yesterday, we uh, proposed a budget amendment to the Metro Council. They considered it, and they'll be voting on it tomorrow. And uh, oh. it is to add 22 new FTE to our department in various places across the entire department. Um, obviously, all of it is capacity, but some areas are operational. Some areas are policy-related. We'll have more updates for you um, in the future. Uh, but particularly as it relates to technical assistance, we are creating a technical assistance uh, team uh, to provide that work that we've been hearing, not just from providers, not just from Metro Council, and Council Lewis doesn't seem to be here right now, but Council Lewis provided us with direction to um, explore that work last year, but also from you all, and that goal that you all have um, decided is a priority for the Tri-County Planning Body and regionalizing homeless services work. And so we're very excited about it. Um, we're a little bit daunted because hiring 22 FTE in one year is um, quite the challenge. But what we do know is that we know we need these people. We know we need these skill sets uh, in order to advance this work and accelerate it. So those are my updates, Valeria. I also have three updates. Um, so the first one is the Oversight Committee Regional Annual Report was released yesterday. Um, the report includes an assessment from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, um, 2022 of the county's performance and recommended improvements that they would like to see in this next fiscal year. It was released yesterday, so we'll be sharing with you in our um, meeting follow-up email. We also developed an annual story report, which focuses more on stories about the people, people who do the work of housing members of our communities and supporting them in their journey, and people whose lives are being transformed by the programs um, that this funding supports. Um, my second update is um, our housing department has completed a process for joint committee recruitment. Um, so our housing department is moving over to a single rolling application for its three committees, the Housing Bond Committee, um, the Tri-County Planning Body, and the Oversight Committee for Supportive Housing Services. Um, the goal of this change is to reduce the staff capacity needed to recruit new members during the year and simplify the initial application process for applicants. So Metro will leave the application open at all times with more specific recruitment windows um, when there are specific vacant positions on any of the committees. As you may know, we're currently recruiting for one more member for this committee. We send you a link to that application in the last email you received, so we encourage that you help us spread the word about the opportunity. And lastly, if you can um, go to the next slide, thank you. Um, our proposed meeting calendar. So you, um, counties and metro staff have worked on drafting a proposal meeting calendar for the rest of the year, and we shared that draft with you last week. Um, if you can, thank you. Oh, it's not on. Zoom can see it, but we can't see it with the button. Folks in Zoom, can you see the slide? Up? Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Can everybody see the slide? Uh, yes, I can. Yes. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, we can. Um, so I'd, I'd like to specifically point out that we're proposing a new meeting <coughs> structure starting in September. Um, the number for each goal that you see in that word document is not associated specifically to the order in which the regional priorities were approved. Um, the structure that we're proposing includes providing some background information and a deep dive on, um, on that goal, an update on the progress, and a space to discuss on the recommendations in order to provide future direction for that work. For our next two meetings, um, this is what we have um, listed in the slide are what we have in uh, plan. So the oversight committee co-chairs are going to present the annual report and the recommendations. Uh, we'll also be coming to you um, with a draft of our regional plan structure and an update in August on the healthcare systems alignment um, as you requested when you approve that goal. And I'll give some space to see if anyone has any questions or comments on any of the updates. Well, let's go, Mercedes, and then Chair Harrington, I see your, your hand. And if we could uh, have Michael articulate what he put in the chat as a question, too. Great. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so my question was about the additional staff capacity, if it was going to include anybody um, doing data analytics. Yes. <laughs> Asked and answered, I love it. Um, Mike had the, the question, what county is the opening for on TCPB for the recruitment? For Clackamas County, Mike. Well, the TCPB runs a little differently than the Oversight Committee. Um, it's more of a collaborative process among the counties and Metro. Um, and so when we originally nominated the Tri-County Planning Body, we all came together as counties um, and and made every effort to make sure that there was geographic di diversity. But unlike the Oversight Committee, where folks are actually designated representatives, that is not the case for the TCPB. So there's a little bit more wiggle room for folks collectively to help uh, identify what skill sets, what backgrounds uh, we might need on the TCPB. I hope that helps. <coughs> so the answer of Clackamas County is not, it's more flexible than that. It's more flexible than that, yes. Uh, okay. Chair Harrington? One is a comment and then the other is a question. Well, two comments, actually. I really appreciate having this information. This is exactly what I was trying to express last meeting that I was really looking for. Uh, but my second comment is related to that. I know that here in Washington County, we have been working our staff flat out. And I know with the Metro staff for TCBP, we've asked you to work really hard to put things together as well. And I just want to make sure, and this is where it's a comment, I just want to make sure there's room for our collective staff to actually do this work. So I will not be disappointed or upset if for whatever reason uh, things need to shift out a month. But I'm really concerned. Here's my comment. I'm really concerned that we haven't given staff enough time to do the work. So I just wanted to share that as one individual in this group. My question is this. I, I see that the July meeting has us going over the SHS Oversight Committee report and, and report process and so forth. And I'm really looking forward to that because what I'm trying to figure out relative to our own calendar is how do we make sure that we're feeding progress into the Oversight Committee in a useful man manner? Certainly there's getting them the information they need for the overall annual report, but then also how do we make sure we've gotten, you know, consensus from this group to provide some periodic uh, updates. And I know Liam is, and, and uh, 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 Valeria and others are more than uh, chartered to actually provide updates along the way, but I just wanted to share here that I have that question totally open to the fact that July is the right place for us to, to begin that conversation. But 
um, I brought it up now because it relates to our meeting plan. That's all. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Chair. Do you want to address kind of the relationship? Sure. I, I want to uh, address the first comment first, if that's all right. And, um, you know, I always appreciate um, elected officials um, being sensitive to the pressures on staff um, at the county government level, but also at the service provider level. Uh, like you say, everybody's working flat out and probably no more than service providers. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we responded with um, a 22 FTE ask of the Metro Council. So thank you very much for that, uh, Chair Harrington. Um, to the Oversight Committee's relationship to the TCPB and the TCPB regional plan um, and how we've been um, initiating that incrementally, we share your, not concern, but we share your priority in that we want to institutionalize these updates a little bit more and the pathways back and forth of the information. Uh, we've now uh, initiated a monthly co-chair meeting, and that's not just uh, the Oversight Committee and the Tri-County Planning Body uh, co-chairs, but also the Affordable Housing Bond co-chairs to talk about the work in general, um, but also creating time on that agenda to talk about the work of the TCPB as it relates to the Oversight Committee and back and forth. So we're looking for ways to institutionalize that, uh, Chair Harrington, and I think the conversation in July is going to be focused on, well, what, do, what does that look like? What kind of information are you all needing to hear from the Oversight Committee and what do you think would be helpful for them to hear, let alone the things that we're actually required to do, which is to deliver a plan to them for approval. So thank you for your comment. Thank you for your question. Um, the answer to your question, I, I suppose, is a little bit vague, but we've already taken action and we intend to take more. Okay, thank you, Liam. Any, any final thoughts on um, the, either the, what's been presented or other comments on staff updates before we move forward? Jess, please. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I, I wanted to get in one. Uh, I know there's going to be more presentation on good staff work underway in the counties, um, but I just wanted to share a really exciting update that we haven't been able to broadcast uh, yet, but this earlier this month, our team in Washington County surpassed our goal to, or achieved and surpassed our goal to house 500 households in permanent supportive housing this year. So we have more than 800 people 800 households um, living in ARLA-funded PSH in Washington County and more than 1,200 individuals. So um, we're, we're celebrating and yes, I think we can all celebrate the, the great accomplishment. Thank you for that update. That, that is a, a wonderful thing to celebrate and congratulations on, on the incredible work. Any last thoughts before we move on? Okay, so the, the next part of our agenda, we're going to have short uh, presentations. Sahan, I'm going to have you introduce yourself before we dive in, but um, we're going to have, to have some short presentations from each of the counties. We'll have um, also a short presentation around the landlord risk mitigation, and then we'll have uh, a good chunk of time for Q&A. So I'm going to ask folks to write down your questions, hold them until the end, and then we'll create that space. But Sahan, you want to say hi, and then I'll ask our county folks to join us at the table. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Name is Sahan McKelvey. Happy to be here. Good to see all of you who are here in person and all of you who we get to see on screen. So, thank you. So the only regret is I don't get to see what sneakers you have on today. <laughs> uh, he's got these fly, like, kind of gray boots on that are just, uh, they, they look great. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to find a way to get them on camera maybe by the end, Chair. Um, is, who's starting? Is Allie? Are you starting? I thought I was. Or no, who's, click, click the next slide. Let's, Monoma. So is it Kadoli? Oh yeah, Matt's gonna tee it up. Matt, why don't you tee it up and we'll figure out who's presenting. Fair enough. Um, so we, what, what we've primarily, I mean, we've accomplished a lot this last year, but I really uh, think this is focusing on the fact that we have identified some very aspirational, but I believe doable goals. And the, you know, to make those happen, uh, a lot of the burden, I think this gets back to what Chair Harrington was raising so appropriately, uh, falls on staff, uh, particularly county staff, because that's where the bulk of the work goes. And so uh, we need to begin to coordinate what county staff are doing as it relates to our goals. Now, they're obviously doing a whole lot of other things as well. 
And so the idea behind this, which I'm really looking forward to, I don't know what's uh, on these slides, but the fact is that they have been, they being the county, have been doing a lot of work and with our goals in mind, I believe. And so this is an opportunity, very brief, to go through and have presentations that relate to the work that would help uh, facilitate the goals and lay the foundations for the uh, programmatic efforts that will achieve the goals. Uh, and then also just one other very quick reminder, the way that we have uh, aimed at getting a strategic plan is to identify particular goals that uh, you know, we feel need to be part of the plan rather than going from a top down where we do everything uh, because realistically we would never get a plan done that way. So this is a, a bottoms up way where we go goal by goal and then we will assemble those. Uh, I think 21 of the 22 people are probably gonna be needed for that. Uh, to, uh, to create a strategic plan. So with that, uh, Ben, it, uh, it looks like Multnomah County, but uh, I will defer to you to um, take it from there with, uh, with our county colleagues. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matt, for that uh, context and set. Um, yes, Multnomah County is officially on the slide. So Kanoi, can you introduce yourself and then dive in? I sure can. So afternoon, everyone. My name is Kanoi Eggleston. My pronouns are she and hers, and I'm the program director at the Joint Office of Homeless Services in Multnomah County. And so I'm here in place of Yesenia Delgado for today's meeting. So the two areas of ongoing work as it relates to the TCPB goals that I'll give a brief update on is the coordinated access new assessment tool that we're embarking on in Multnomah County, as well as an update on the Tri-County HMIS implementation. I'll go over to the next slide. Awesome. So uh, I'll start off with our coordinated entry in Multnomah County. So the joint office administers four unique coordinated entry systems, right, for adult-only households, families, youth households, and households experiencing domestic and sexual violence. And so a quick background around where the coordinated entry systems were developed. So in 2009, there was a law that required our COCs to develop um, and implement a coordinated assessment system. And then in 2015, HUD uh, recommended the utilization of what we call the VI SPDAT, which is a tool to meet the new assessment requirement. And so when Multnomah, or when the joint office, excuse me, opened up in 2016, we were in charge with managing uh, the various entry systems that we have. And so let's move on to the next slide, please. Awesome, thank you. I can't really see the slide, so I'm just, <laughs> I'm just going to scroll down. There we go. So as the COCs uh, were implementing the VI SPDAT, you know, there was research that was conducted on the efficacy. And what, what some research found was there was an opportunity to update the tool to more robustly assess vulnerability and center racial equity. So in 2020, the joint office embarked in a process to develop a new tool based on local values and needs. So currently we are in the process of moving away from the VI SPDAT assessment tool for coordinated access in our adult and family systems. The scope of work will really focus on those two systems since the youth and domestic violence systems already went through a very robust and intensive process to design their tools. So a lot of the new tool will start to focus on, you know, questions that identify priority populations, questions that will also help to identify uh, more specifically the need and which type of housing resource will best uh, address that individual's need. And then in 2021, um, we had an oversight committee that was appointed to ensure that this was a community-led process. And then um, SHS funds have supported in hiring technical consultants uh, to develop and validate this new tool. So next slide, please. Uh, let's see, great. So, um, some of the some of the work that has been completed uh, thus far has been contracting uh, with Focus Strategies, who is our project manager, and then also with C4 Innovations, who is supporting in a very robust community engagement. And so, like I said, we have another area that we have completed is appointing that oversight committee to really be able to provide recommendations and to review the draft of the new tool. So that committee and those members are comprised of various service providers who engage in our coordinated access uh, in the adult and family systems. So leadership from our from the chat workers to housing navigators, 
uh, to PSH retention staff, also um, ensuring that there were a robust representation of our culturally specific providers on the oversight committee, and specifically those that come from our BIPOC collaborative that you'll see within our coordinated access system in the adult system. Um, and then also, like I shared earlier, we have conducted and completed an extensive community engagement process over the last year uh, to inform the tool design. A lot of what we heard was just around the experience of the previous tool um, and the experience for assessors and participants. So really you know, it was a lengthy tool, uh, it had a lot of, lot of questions, a um, lot of questions and just the time spent to administer the tool. So really looking at a new tool, we, we, we use that community engagement to really inform uh, the creation of this new tool. And then through that community engagement, what we also were able to accomplish was really engaging with uh, folks with lived experience. And through that, where that came out um, was the creation of a, of a lived experience uh, a, 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 a lived experience body. And so it's uh, gonna be called the Housing Connection Collaborative. So it's a real, it's a group an advisory group uh, to support, continue to support in this next year of our work uh, with the tool. And so, and lastly, I wanted to just mention that, you know, in completing over this last year, really ensuring that the tool aligns with all the work that is being done with uh, the creation of the by name list. So the built for zero uh, by name list. So ensuring there's no duplication, this coordinated access tool would be a subset of that built for zero by name list. And so what we, next slide, please. I'm so sorry. I'm clicking away on this other screen. <laughs> there we go. So looking forward into this last year of, of the new tool creation, we're really gonna start, we're gonna start piloting, uh, the piloting the new tool in the adult and family system, uh, implementing needed changes, finalizing the tool, you know, training providers across both systems and being able to utilize the new tool and the estimated rollout date that we'll have for both of the systems collectively will be June of next year. So that's my really quick brief update. I'm gonna transition us over now to the Tri-County uh, HMIS implementation. So another area of focus that this group has uh, identified was really focusing on right regional metrics and making data-driven decisions. So in line with that, um, I think we have a pretty, we have a process, I think that is just pretty incredible opportunity, right? To start sharing data, to be able to inform regionally, uh, just really data-driven decision-making. So in line with that, the transfer of HMIS administration will be pretty integral. Um, so currently, oh, we're already on to the next slide. Currently, there are three homeless management information systems in the state of Oregon. So Clackamas, Multnomah, and Washington counties comp, uh, compose like one of those systems. And up until recently, uh, the city of Portland has administered HMIS uh, for the Tri-County region. So Multnomah County will be taking over that responsibility from the city of Portland to administer HMIS system for our region. And a few weeks ago, we just finalized the agreement with the city of Portland to transfer ownership um, of HMIS administration. And so currently the, oh, next slide, please. I think it's next slide. There we go. Uh, so currently the tri-counties are collaborating on several processes to update HMIS. So doing a lot of uh, the COCs are developing, you know, COC specific versions of the HMIS admin docs. So things like participant agreements, license agreements, creating a charter for some of the uh, there's going to be two HMIS governance groups. And then really also taking steps to being able to ensure the accuracy of the new database, doing things like working on reorganizing the visibility within HMIS. So what folks are seeing within the HMIS system. And then, of course, lastly, just ensuring we have constant communication loop with all of the provider agencies around this upcoming transition and change. And so the last slide I have for you all is just reiterating um, that all the primary system, you know, admin responsibilities will now be carried out by Multnomah County. That includes our homeless services projects, but all other projects that are captured in service point. And then Multnomah County will sign intergovernmental agreements with Clackamas and Washington counties as well. And I think just to wrap up kind of my, my quick brief update is, you know, just such an incredible opportunity we have with this HMIS um, administration transfer and really being able to hone in on that regional um, ability to share data and, and to make those data driven uh, decisions. There's my, there's my quick update for you there. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. So Washington County, let's bring you up. And again, we'll, we'll have uh, time for Q&A after all the presentations. 
as you come up, introduce yourself, and then dive <coughs> right in. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Allie Alexander Sheridan. I'm on the Homeless Services team at Washington County, and I work on a lot of our health and housing projects. And so I'm bringing you today a very um, quick update on three of our key projects. So we can go to next slide. So the first is our recuperative care program. Um, our recuperative care program um, has a goal to provide shelter and stabilizing med medical support for houseless individuals that are discharging from inpatient settings after having surgery or um, a severe illness. This will be 10 initial beds at one of our Hillsboro non-congregate shelter sites. Our partners on this project are Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Center, which is a federally qualified health center in Washington County. Um, they'll be providing the primary medical supports on site at our shelter, and then also so Central City Concern is a partner on the project and they are um, acting as a consultant as we build out and operationalize the project. We're looking to launch this project um, this summer. So um, our goal is to launch this project next month. And then we also anticipate having future coordination with Clackamas County as they look to launch a recuperative care program as well. We know that there's a really big regional need for recuperative care capacity. Um, and our strategy is to be responsive to that regional need by building out a program that um, is coordinated with our partners, um, knowing that Central City is really the only provider in Multnomah County doing this work. The next is our healthcare case conferencing. So this is a bi-weekly case conferencing table um, that's in partnership with Kaiser Permanente and Providence and also HealthShare, where we focus on a by-name list modeled much like our Built for Zero case conferencing table. Um, where we case conference folks experiencing homelessness that also are identified to have a disabling condition um, and an identified healthcare need. Um, this project in particular is important because we have a data sharing agreement with our health systems that enables us to have cross-sector coordination. Um, and we also have a model that's scalable for regional implementation. So we've had some early conversations with Clackamas County um, as we talk about scaling this regionally. And we think this will also be re really useful as we look for, as we look to more health and housing integration in the future. And then the last project that I'll highlight for you is a pretty big one. It's the Medicaid 1115 waiver um, that's looking to launch in July 2024, at least the housing benefits of the waiver. That's the latest update we have from the Oregon Health Authority. Um, it's the first in the nation demonstration that will occur over a five-year period. Um, included in the benefit, particularly the health-related social needs package, is six months of rental assistance, housing navigation, and case management support that will all be billable services through Medicaid. Um, currently, we have an ongoing bi-weekly regional coordination meeting with HealthShare. Um, Trillium will be joining that table, Multnomah County, Clackamas County, and Metro. Um, and the goal of this coordination work is to have Medicaid, the Medicaid benefit integrated with the existing homeless services system of care. And that's it for me. Awesome, thank you. Um, Fahid, I think you're next. These guys are gonna come up. Sounds right, thank you, Ben. Good evening, everyone. I'm Vahid Brown, I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Deputy Director of Housing and Community Development in Clackamas County. And I'm gonna provide a brief update about couple of things that are underway in our county related to the last two of the TCPB's identified goals. Uh, Matt shared that list of goals at the top of this presentation. Um, if we'll remember that the last two have to do with training uh, or technical assistance for, for providers and um, the hiring and retention of the workforce that does this vital work in the community, um, also known as capacity building and pay equity. Um, with capacity building, um, <coughs> The, I just want to kind of restate the goal because it's so it so um, elegantly captures exactly what it is that we're doing here. Um, your goal that you identified for technical assistance was that organizations have access to the technical assistance required to operate at a high level of organizational functionality. The needs of culturally specific providers will be prioritized through all program design. So we're doing that in Clackamas County. Um, we have contracted with four community-based organizations that are organizational development experts that can 
Uh, two of those are culturally specific consultant agencies that have a, that specialize in providing organizational development support to culturally specific agencies. Um, and we've contracted with these four community-based, with these four organizational development consultants and uh, given them a lot of runway and flexibility and said, we would like to um, offer your services as a menu of options. You are four available providers of technical assistance and organizational development services that any of our contracted providers with our culturally specific agencies getting first pick have access to. We will provide our all of our contracted agencies with a kind of a menu. These are the, these are the four agencies on contract. These are who they are. These are the things they specialize in. These are what they are able to offer. And if they're not offer, able to offer something specific that you all identify together that you need, they can subcontract with another agency to provide that specific skill set. So, for example, if it was an agency that really uh, their sweet spot is developing um, a quality board and a, a charter and a mission statement and all of that, and doing some really foundational organizational development, but they aren't, it's not in their wheelhouse to really help an agency develop fiscal controls and accounting practices. And they might subcontract with a, an agency that specializes in nonprofit accounting. Um, so we are making this technical assistance available to all of the providers that we contract with. And we've told the four agencies on contract that we don't wanna dictate what technical assistance, what areas of growth our providers need. We want them to do that. So here's a contract, here's, here's plenty of runway for you to move and, and get working. When, when our agencies contact you and ask for a, a consultation, our answer is yes. If they want what they want from you, if you're coming back to us and saying, hey, they asked for this, can we provide it to them? The answer is yes. We want you to support the agencies in meeting their hopes and dreams and becoming the best agencies that they can be in their own terms. Um, and the, the first bullet point, we have asked in all of our procurements, and um, you know, we, we continue to do this, uh, about capacity building needs. So this is a part of, of, the, uh, of the questions that we're asking everyone who responds to funding opportunities in Clackamas County. Does your agency have capacity building needs? And if so, can you please articulate them so that we can include that right up front as part of the, the award, contract award? So it, it, the, the capacity building needs are part of the beginning of the conversation when we enter into contract negotiations with agencies when we're funding them. So that's another element of where we're, we're, we're attempting to meet capacity building needs. Also, to go back to the four agencies, these four uh, organization, organizational development consultants, um, Distracted by baby. That's, <laughs> that's no, it's great. It's a lovely sound. That's a happy distraction. Um, we have also asked them to help uh, help identify in, in their work with with our CBOs further capacity building needs that require further investment and funding from us. So if a, if an agency didn't say yes, we need X when they applied for funding, but they really do. And they, they, they confirm that in their conversations with the development consultant and say, actually, we really do need a, an admin person on our staff that helps us with uh, fiscal controls or whatever. Then the development consultant in the agency can say, after we've done our work, we think this agency needs this. Would you please consider investing in that as a capacity building investment for that agency? So that'll be another route through which we can make capacity building investments with our providers. And in, in all of this, is the emphasis is on supporting smaller agencies, culturally specific and emergency, emerging grassroots groups in our community. So that's how we're, how we're in Clackamas County moving forward with respect to that, that goal area of the Tri-County Planning Body. The next slide speaks to the other, another goal area having to do with um, hiring and, and retaining staff. A um, couple of things, the, there's a, a, a survey and, and report, an excellent report that, that Washington, so just to speak to regionalism, we borrow a lot from each other. Um, Washington County developed a great tool to assess the pay equity state of the landscape today with all of their providers. Um, a survey with all of their providers and they produce a report based upon it that gives Washington County a very good sense now of what is the, the range of the rate of compensation across different agencies and where are there maybe needs to fix gaps or, or shore up the rate of compensation. So we have asked to implement the same tool. They were very generous in, in sharing that with us. So we're going to do that and that will allow us to produce a similar report so, so that we can provide ourselves and you all and we'll all have a better sense of the data. What is the, the state of the problem when it comes to the range of pay 
how we're addressing this in Clackamas County, I know that the goal of the TCPB is that there's a standard across the region that informs the rate of compensation in county funded contracts that, that supports a livable wage for folks who are doing frontline service delivery work. Now, how we're doing this in Clackamas County is we are focusing on it as a point of conversation in every contract negotiation. So this is government showing up differently. And I think that's something that the, the supportive housing services measure is requiring us to do. This is not necessarily typical of a government to CBO contract negotiation, which is looking at the budget, looking at the rate of compensation in the budget, the, the, the wage scale and saying from government, this looks too low. You, you are, you're proposing a budget that has frontline staff doing service work, delivering services to vulnerable people in the community at 21 or $22 an hour. We would like you to think about that, reconsider that and resubmit a budget that has a more adequate rate of compensation and then we can talk further. So that's how, that's how we're approaching livable wages in, in our suite of contracts in Clackamas County. It's one of the first topics of conversation and it has led to some interesting outcomes. I mean, in, in, in one instance, we awarded a contract to an agency that after 90 days, they, they, they're, they're, they, we, in that first conversation, I, I went through that process. I said, this is a pretty low rate of compensation. Can you please raise it? They raised some of the issues and barriers that TCBB has already heard about with, relate, with regard to pay equity, having to do with the, um, the pay equity law and not being able to raise the wages for everyone else in their agency. And so really not being able to, not being able to budge on that point. I said, well, you were, you were awarded the funding, so let's, let's move forward. After 90 days, they were unable to hire any staff. The, the rate of compensation was too low. So I let them know that, that we were going to have to reallocate the funding to other agencies because they were unable to launch a program. They came back subsequently and said, we've decided to raise wages across our agency and we would like to return to the table and execute a contract with you. And we did, and that was a successful outcome that began with saying, this is, this is not adequate. This is not a professional living wage for someone who wants to make a career of serving the community and providing, providing housing to vulnerable people in, the, in our towns and communities. That's not entry level work. It's difficult, it needs to be valued and it needs to be supported with a living wage. So that's our update on how we're, we're making, attempting to make progress with this issue that's we know so important to the Tri-County Planning Body. Awesome, thank you, uh, Vahid. Um, so we're gonna bring up, I think we have a team of folks um, that's gonna talk about the uh, work around landlord liaisons. Where are we gonna, where are we gonna seat folks? Three chairs right there, okay. <coughs> you wanna do a mic check? Is that what you're, you're, uh, you're so one, they should, the one should work. So if you can all do introductions and then dive right in. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? All right, is that better? All right, uh, so my name is Monica Vila. I'm the landlord liaison for Washington County. And so we are here today. Thank you for uh, inviting us to come and talk about our work that we're doing. So I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. I'm Chris Pence. I'm the landlord liaison for Clackamas County. Hi, I'm Erin Goldwater, I use she, her pronouns. I'm with Multnomah County with the Joint Office of Homeless Services. And although I am not technically the landlord liaison, I am filling that role right now um, at Multnomah County. All right. So in January uh, 2023, we started a meeting on a monthly basis to um, all three of us along with Metro to discuss the regionalization of our work. Mainly our first bullet point was really the RMP. We were going through the contract, getting that finalized. And um, so really talking about how we were going to um, promote it, let landlords know about it, provide education to landlords. Um, during our meetings, we really take that time to plan a lot of the trainings for landlords. So between the three of us, 
well, sometimes more, um, that join our meeting. Uh, we really talk about the things and, and challenges that we're hearing from the landlords, from the providers, participants, kind of seeing where the bottlenecks are, what we can regionalize. And also, while we do all of that, keeping in mind that there are things that are different for each of our counties, just based on the population that we serve, our, um, you know, some local laws. So really uh, a lot of our discussions, you know, focus around the landlord recruitment, how we can increase uh, units, available units to the participants for the landlords, um, how we can really do it in a sustainable way and a user-friendly way to not create more barriers and additional paperwork, because um, as we all know, there's already a lot of paperwork involved. So to try to minimize that and not add to it. So we really want to, uh, we take that the time to really discuss the things that are working in each of our counties and, you know, borrow <laughs> from each of our counties and really implement things that were like, oh, that's a great idea. Like, we didn't think about that. Like, let's see how that works for, for our area. So that way, when, as landlords are navigating through each of our jurisdictions, um, they're not seeing a completely different, uh, you know, response. Or even when we discuss the RMP, we really... Uh, talk about the questions that we get and how are we going to answer this together versus each separately, even if it's a question specifically for one county. So that way, if landlords are coming to a different county, they're not getting a completely different answer. So I think that's a lot of what we really spend our time doing. And, you know, just really trying to iron out all of the things that we see coming up. Um, we do meet officially once a month um, for the landlord liaison group, but we also meet on a weekly basis to talk about the RMP, uh, any claims that are coming in, any challenges that we're seeing. And so we also take that time additionally to, uh, you know, just see what's going on and not have it wait until the following month. Uh, slide, please. So we're here today, first and foremost, to talk about the new risk mitigation program, uh, which is now part of every person who gets uh, ARLA voucher, the Regional Long-Term Rent Assistance Voucher. Um, the landlord is protected with the RMP, the Risk Mitigation Program. Um, this is a huge success in efforts to regionalize the, the landlord engagement programming of the, the ARLA, and uh, it was started officially on February 15th, but it can go retroactive as well. Um, and it's uh, the three counties negotiated and executed a contract with the Housing Development Center, uh, which was a long process, as you can imagine. Contracting with three counties um, at once was hard, but uh, we got it done. And this, this program can pay for damage or unpaid rent or certain other administrative costs that a landlord incurs um, due to the activities or behavior of an ARLA participant. Um, and then they can apply for reimbursement directly to the Housing Development Center. Um, the benefits for ARLA participants are clear. I mean, it, it prevents unnecessary um, property debt, landlord debt, that could make it harder to rehouse them. Um, and it could also prevent eviction um, so that if the landlord can recoup the loss from the damage or unpaid rent, they may be able to avoid eviction. Um, and for the landlord, um, this is a huge benefit. It, it avoids having to go through an eviction process, which landlords hate, believe it or not. Um, the legal fees, the time involved, um, the legal risk, or trying to collect money from tenants that can't afford to pay. Um, and it also is great for recruitment because it gives landlords the peace of mind to rent to someone who maybe doesn't check all the boxes on their screening uh, because they know that unlike private market renters, this person comes with a guarantee, a financial guarantee. Um, I wanted to just briefly share one story. We had a, a small mom and pop type landlord uh, with an Arla participant who caused thousands of dollars of worth of damage to their property and they applied for reimbursement, and because of the RMP, they decided they wanted to turn around and keep renting to ARLA participants. Um, so already, even though it's brand new, um, we're really seeing the effects of it um, in recruitment and retention of landlords. 
Next slide, please. I'm sorry. Oh, you wanted me to hold questions. Never mind. <laughs> oh, yes, thanks. All right. So since we launched or kind of um, had our contracts aligned and the program was up and running, we've had um, five different claims um, submitted. And so landlords are already kind of tapping into this resource. Um, Chris just shared a story about one of them. And then there is another um, example of the claim um, kind of, in, well, I'll get to that later. But as far <laughs> as like in um, some coordinated outreach. Um, so within I don't know what else to say about this, but we are already seeing um, claims being submitted and um, tenants having their uh, potential debt kind of cleared due to the risk mitigation program. Next slide, please. So with the RMP, there also comes an RMP advisory committee. And so um, HDC is really the one that is the administrator for the RMP. So they are kind of taking on the um, work of kind of forming the committee. We're, help, we're helping with the recruitment part for the committee. And the purpose of the committee is really to develop um, look at the policies, review the policies, have input, and so it gives landlords an opportunity um, not to just be the recipients of this benefit, but also to have a say with um, the policies. And you know, as everybody I'm sure is familiar, when a new program rolls out, there's things that come up that you say, "Oh, like we didn't think about that. <laughs> like we didn't think about this situation when we were forming this." Um, you know these policies. And so this is just another way to um, have the landlords be a part of it, be a part of, have a say in how this functions. Um, I think it's really important because they are the ones that are, um, along with the participants, uh, getting the benefit of the RMP. And so when that's one of the the things that we look forward to doing is the recruitment has already started. We've had a couple landlords already reach out to HDC and let them know that they're interested in being part of the committee. So there will be uh, four to ten members um, in the in the committee, and they'll provide, you know, uh, their experience. Will be, you know, providing homeless services, affordable ho affordable housing, um, ownership, property management, and or lived experience. And so I think. Uh, forming when you form policies it's super important to have the group of the people that are being affected at the table to have a say and so we are really looking forward to that we will prioritize um, people from um, BIPOC communities uh, you know people with lived experience um, and really have people at the table that represent the our, our communities that we're serving next slide please All right, so the landlord engagement that we have, so we, during our meetings, like I mentioned earlier, we do talk a lot about the regionalization of our work, um, you know, fully knowing that landlords move between counties. Um, there are, you know, some things that are gonna be a little bit different just based on each county, and that we may uh, do things that look in a different way, but at the core, it's the same. And so uh, for Washington County, really my role as a landlord liaison is to really be the connector between the landlord and the providers, the housing authority, and kind of just do a lot of um, troubleshooting, technical assistance, if there's questions that they have about paperwork, helping them navigate those areas, um, track any vacancies that we have so landlords can reach out and let me know if there's vacancies, then I would reach out to providers, kind of coordinate and help fill those units. Um, if it's necessary, uh, provide any kind of mediation services because as we know, things can get a little bit you know, confusing sometimes or mixed messaging and so it's easier to have someone at the table, just a neutral party, say like, all right, let's talk about this, let's see what's going on and try to fix it and um, not just in that instance, but then also thinking about the future and like different ways of preventing that. Um, and also doing uh, specific landlord trainings. And for us, we are kind of focusing a little bit more, there will be trainings that will apply to all three counties, so we will definitely do all of those trainings together. Um, there are some trainings that may be a little bit more county specific as far as 
you know, how the process goes when you're filling out paperwork for the housing authority or how to check your payments. That's a little bit more um, specific to our county. And uh, in Clackamas County, I'm doing a lot of the same work. Um, I, I really try to focus on educating landlords about the benefits of ARLA, um, case management, guaranteed rental income, the risk mitigation program, and then also helping our case providers that are doing the housing navigation to also sell the benefits of the program when they're helping participants apply. Um, also advocating for supporting and supporting landlords who are either new to the program and new to the housing authority and rent assistance, um, or when things get hard and, and they need some guidance. Um, in Clackamas County, we have uh, something a little different called the Landlord Partnership Program, where we, we offer some extra incentives um, when landlords are willing to reserve units for our participants or modify their screening criteria. Um, it's new and still in the works, but uh, we're really excited about it, and uh, we've seen some interest already and have a number of units reserved waiting for participants. Great, and then in Multnomah County, um, I wanted to highlight some of our additional kind of landlord engagement outside of ARLA. Um, but first, we um, released a notice of funding availability in, in February for our landlord engagement. So in Multnomah County, we are contracting out our services that uh, Monica and Chris are doing. And so we are expecting New Narrative, who is the um, the awardee of that, of that NOFA, to start that work in um, July, so at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, <clears throat> and then in addition to, um, or outside of Arlo, we had um, our Move in Multnomah initiative that was launched a little over a year ago. Um, it included the public communication campaign to recruit new landlords, um, and it also came with a kind of menu of incentives that look very similar to what we have now in the Arlo program. And um, through Move in Multnomah, we were able to place 214 households. Um, another kind of effort coming out of Multnomah County is the Housing Multnomah Now initiative, where we just recently released a um, letter of, or a request for a letter of intent of interest from qualified providers to increase our system-wide landlord engagement and recruitment. And then the last thing, kind of under provider programs, I wanted to, um, to elevate that we are also working with providers on agency leasing, which was formerly, we formerly referred to as master leasing. And so to increase access to even more um, units through direct relationships with, with landlords. And related, one more thing related to that is that we are also working with the TA provider in order to do um, the work to get kind of the best practices around agency leasing um, in order to make that more accessible to, to more providers. Last slide. So we wanted to end kind of looking at um, the things that we have done and kind of collaborated with our coordinated outreach and then where we are going. Um, so since we have finalized the contract, um, we have been able to coordinate in, uh, with Housing Development Center two informational sessions for landlords where um, about 30 landlords participated in those to learn more about the program. We have worked together to um, release a joint press release, um, which then led to a story um, in Coin6 News. And so if you have access to the slides, there is a link to that. Um, and that was one of the things that I wanted to highlight is that there's a quote in there, um, kind of a very real life, and I don't know if it's the same story that you were referring to, um, about a, a resident who um, had to go into kind of higher level of care into the hospital. Um, and was an, unable to pay their portion of the rent. And then also, um, that was then covered by the, the RMP, and also um, some damages that were caused as they were trying to get the resident out of the, the unit um, was also kind of um, highlighted and being you know, able to mitigate those, those damages. And then kind of looking forward, um, we are working with Multifamily Northwest um, to do trainings for landlords and then also um, kind of looking at opportunities to participate in conferences, including the Multifamily Northwest Spectrum 2023 conference, as well as others. Great, thank you. Well, why don't we open it up for questions? Mercedes. 
Chair Harrington, was, was that you trying to ask a question earlier? Uh, Mercedes, jump in. Um, so my first question was, uh, when can somebody make a claim? So they can make a claim at any time. Uh, the participant doesn't necessarily have to move out of the unit. They can still be in the unit. And so we've had situations where, you know, a landlord reached out to me uh, about a week ago and said, like, hey, we have this damage. Like, I remember you talked about the RMP. Like, if we file, you know, a claim, then we don't have to go through eviction, right? I'm like, no, <laughs> you don't. And so it can really be any time. There is a 12-month um, like restriction time for when you file a claim. So if like damages were done today, then you know 12 months from today, or really it's whenever the landlord was able to uh, do an inspection of the unit. So if somebody, you know, it took a while to move someone out and even if the damages happened six months ago, but then they weren't actually able to go in and inspect the unit until six months later, then that's when their 12 months uh, begins. Um, and then I was wondering how many Arla vouchers are out there? I'm trying to get a sense of like, you know, you have five claims out of. Yeah, so we have 820 for Washington County. And so we have one um, claim that has started in on our, for our county. Um, and then I don't know if you know. Uh, just off the top of my head, we I think we have close to 400 households leased up with Arla vouchers in Clackamas County. Not quite 400. And I don't know off the top of my head what we have in Multnomah County. Okay. Um, and then last question. Uh, I, I think I lost the thread um, when we got to the slide where there was like three different buckets about what things are the same. So it sounded like Communication, maybe? Triage? Mm -hmm. Anything else yeah. that's, this, that's the same as opposed yeah. to those different components? Yeah, so we have a lot of things that are the same. A lot of the landlord recruitment, outreach, education, like the bigger components of the program. The um, So that's, uh, let's see, recruitment, education, um, like the RMP, definitely the same. Um, what else? Yeah, the, we're, we're coordinating our media campaigns. Or, you yeah, know, um, I think anything that really has to do with like a broader reach for landlords, like all of that, we're really trying to do it the same way. Um, so yeah. Like kind of the core of yeah. Yeah. And then as like issues come up, if there's something that comes up for one of our counties and we're like, oh, we didn't think about that, like let's look back at ours and see how we do it. And then um, as those things kind of come up, that's when we really try to look and see what we can regionalize um, within our like scope. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Chair Harrington. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, I was uh, really pleased to hear that it sounds like there's this company, HDC, that you've been able to tap into. Uh, uh, is this something that they have have as part of their portfolio previously in line of work, or is this, I mean, a new space or or what? I was just looking for that general grounding. Yeah. So HDC is the organization that also administers the the city's or um, PHB's uh, risk mitigation pool, which is. Um, similar to what we were doing and was kind of the foundation for the regional um, ARLA RMP. Great, thank you. Any other questions for either the landlord liaisons or our three county presenters? Matt? Yeah, um, I, I think that's mostly for Bahid, but others uh, as well. I'm really intrigued and encouraged by what you described as to the training and the idea of having a menu of different kind, uh, different areas that uh, that the the uh, the different uh, entities can choose from. What I'm wondering, one of the, the things I've found in working in in education areas, is that sometimes people don't know what they don't know. And is there any thought or or any approach whereby somebody could just sit down with agents? I'm thinking of the smaller and newer ones that 
you know, wouldn't have necessarily the, the background and, and areas uh, within their organization to go through with them and try to help them identify the areas in which they might need services so that they become more aware of what's available. Because I think this is the right track, uh, what you're doing, and, uh, and very, very promising. I hope we can uh, regionalize that as well. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And I can speak to, to that, how we're doing that in Clackamas County. That is um, a part of the scope of work for each of the agencies, that kind of um, blue sky assessment, you know, that, and, and we heard this from, from the consultants as well, that, um, that, you know, they won't know what's needed. And oftentimes their, their client won't know what's needed until there's a, a, some lengthy conversation. Right. So we have it phased, our, our scopes of work for each of the four consultants is in four phases. And in that phase one, it's, it's that open-ended conversation and exploration. And we've given the providers, the community-based organizations, a whole lot of agency there, where if, if they feel they choose the consultant or you know the, the organizational development consultant A off the menu, they have a, a handful of meetings with them and they feel like, this isn't clicking, we're not speaking the same language, I, whatever, then they can say, we wanna meet with another one. And that's fine, go for it, that's totally fine. Um, so we've just tried to capacitate enough and, and different types of organizational development consultants that um, our providers will feel comfortable finding the right fit. And if it, if it means they meet with all four of them, great. We have no problem with that. Cool. And then a follow on real quick, um, your, your story of the entity that uh, you know, wasn't paying an adequate wage and then had to really you know, redo the whole thing after 90 days, nobody got, <laughs> nobody got hired. Um, what are the resources in terms of funding that can be put in to help them? Because there is that Oregon law about pay equity, and we've talked about that in prior meetings, so I won't uh, go, go through that again. But is there something you can do to put more money on the table to ease the burden? Because I think the problem's real. That's a that's a, a great thought and a, 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 a potential for further conversation with the TCBB. I mean, one of the things that three counties have done with capacity building is offer um, you know uh, hiring bonuses and other bonuses and other incentives for their workforce. And those those are things that could be provided to an agency as a capacity building grant that then they could use at their discretion, right? So if there was a way for them to supplement the incomes or 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 make a bump in some way for the rest of their workforce, it's I'm not going to go on and on, but yes, Matt, I think that's a, that is something that sort of lines up with some of the ways that we're thinking about this. Cool. Yeah. Cause I do think, and particularly uh, this is an area that I hope that as the TCPB, we will uh, pursue because uh, from what I have been able to learn, this is a very real problem and, uh, and there ought to be ways uh, to solve it. I mean, the ultimate bit is everybody ought to get a living wage. Um, and such. Now, how do we fund that becomes the, the dicey part, obviously. Uh, thank you, Mindy. I'm curious, somewhat related, to what extent are Multnomah and Washington also doing some of that pay equity work, or how, how much of it is the same across all three counties, the strategy, and how much of it is pretty independent? So can we, let's get, Jess is walking up. Uh, Kanoi, do you want to start? And then uh, we'll have Washington County also. Sure. So I think it's similar, but how it shows up might look, you know, a little bit different. So if we think about we've done retention and hiring bonuses, we also did a hazard pay during COVID. Um, and then earlier this year, we explored, a, it, it was smaller in, in this fiscal year to explore throughout all, all of the contracts, you know, additional support in increasing wages, but that was a minimal, I mean, that wasn't, that's not going to meet the need, right? And so it was a smaller attempt at the beginning of the year to start that process. And then throughout this year, we've conducted a wage study analysis. We're finalizing the policy recommendations for that with the hope that that can carry through um, as a more robust way to address it. So in the similar vein, similar things that Vahid has said, and and yet maybe te technically how and how much it has shown up, there will be a difference slightly. And then I wanted to actually make a quick comment about what Matt said as well. I think we have a, a dedicated person within our within the joint office that supports exactly that, right? Which is the new culturally specific and emerging organizations to note 
some folks don't don't know what to ask for, what to look for. Right. And so you need somebody who does know that and can support in those conversations and then connect to where whether that be technical assistance supports or co consultants or, as Vahid mentioned, a phased approach there in Clackamas. So, like I said, we have similar things, though it may show up just slightly different operationally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Jess? Um, sure. Uh, so to answer the question about our pay equity work in Washington County, uh, as, as Vahid mentioned, we have also conducted uh, the survey to understand where our organizational partners are at. And um, while I think on an average we're doing really well as a, a network in Washington County, there's definitely areas for uh, to support some organizations in bringing up some of the, uh, the, the pay for some of the frontline staff. Our contracts in Washington County across the board support a living wage. We uh, fund each organization each organization's budget it supports an eighty thousand dollar per FTE for all of the positions, and that includes benefits. So we estimate that that could calculate to a twenty six dollar an hour salary. Um, so the funding is there. To one of Matt's earlier questions, uh, I think the pay equity issue, as Vahid was really very thoughtfully describing, is more about how that presents in each individual organization and the other positions they have on staff from other contracts and how we as the county work to individually support each organization in thinking through those challenges. And I think we have a lot to learn from you, Vahid, so I really appreciate how you uh, broke that down. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, Commissioner Jayapal, were you? Steve was Okay, Steve, please. It's, it's difficult because all the presentations were great. I'm going to jump back to landlords for a second um, stuff because I think pay equity is a very important discussion too. It's tough to go back and forth. But um, the landlord piece of great work. I'm really happy to see the, region, the mitigation pool is done, is up and running. Uh, and Arla is in all three counties. Uh, I would like to get a plan. When someone asks a question, I hope next month we could say exactly how many Arla vouchers there are countywide and region wide. I think what we were, it's prime now. That all three counties have been working well together, it's still not well known. And we need a kind of concerted effort, I think public relations, marketing, to really enlist the support of the larger community. And I hope you could recommend that. I mean, the whole reason of this regional body, I think, is to think about where we can add uh, incentives and efforts for regional efforts. And frankly, we in working in government know the differences and where the lines are but the general public really doesn't. It's the Portland metropolitan area. And landlords are going to be working wherever they own property. So I think it would be great if we could do a concerted effort. And I'd be interested to see what you and the Metro staff come up with. Because now's time. Because you have both the rent assistance and you have the mitigation fund. So thanks. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Commissioner? Thank you, Ben. It, it is hard to switch back and forth. But I think you captured <laughs> <laughs> some of what I was going to say about landlords. But on wages. I guess just a couple of additional thoughts. I think Multnomah County is different um, in, in a lot of ways, one of which is that we have a lot of older contracts that have been around for a long time. You know, I've heard them referred to as legacy contracts. And I think those present a different set of issues because our practice has been to renew those contracts and add a COLA. And that hasn't, what that hasn't done um, is bridge the, the gap, sort of the structural gap between wages in the nonprofit world and wages as they should be. I was gonna, I was gonna point to a different location, but wages as they should be. So I do think that presents a different challenge. We don't, um, Kanoi, I'm sure you can c correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't have a, a per se a living wage uh, built into our contracts. We're trying to get there, but it is, because of that history and the complexity and the volume of our contracts, I think to this point it has been a year by year, well, let's give a little bit more, let's give a little bit more, let's give a little bit more. And what we are going to be trying to get to is something that's more comprehensive. Um, we are also looking uh, this year at doing, I think I heard somebody, I'm sorry, I can't hear well because I've got the, this allergy thing, but I think I heard someone talking about a grant, block grant sort of process um, to deal with some of the operational issues around 
distributing wages, figuring out what equity looks like within an organization, between organizations, um, and to use sort of uh, looking at using a grant process to say, here's a block grant, what is gonna work best for your organization? Use it as, as you think is gonna work best to address this issue. So that's a couple things from, from what I uh, uh, experienced at Multnomah County. And then um, I think to Matt's point, you know, in terms of funding, so at some point, collectively as a region, and then frankly other funders as well, the counties aren't the only funders of these services and of these organizations, we need a more comprehensive approach. We need the state, federal government, philanthropy. I mean, it needs to be more comprehensive for it to really be systematic and systematized. Um, I don't know what that looks like. I think many of the people in this room are participating in the Oregon Solutions Project, which is building a table to, to figure out what some approaches might be. It's a pretty slow process. Um, but I think that the TCPB has an opportunity with our Regional Strategic Investment Fund, our RCIF, if we come up with a way to regionalize and standardize to also provide seed money to do some of this work. It's not going to be enough to do it, you know, to sustain the, the wage increases that we need, but it could be enough to bridge particular um, periods of time as we're implementing some of this. And I, I do hope that we will, as we move forward with the wage work, that we will really look at using those funds. And I, you know, I, I think, I guess at the end of this, I have a request from Metro that at some point in our, in our list of things to talk about, we have sort of an, uh, some sort of briefing on what's in those funds, those RCIFs. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure folks know, and I think it would be good to understand What's the pool of money that is sitting there waiting to be invested by this body? Awesome, great. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Christina, and then we'll do a little process check because we're a little behind, but Christina? Oh, I think you remuted, Christina. Uh, sorry. On, on pay, um, I wanted to say that I have a hope that when money is being granted to organizations that the question about pay, dif pay differential is asked. Many people are bilingual, especially, you know, some of the housing providers, they're bilingual and their, their, their extra skill is not pay. They just, a, a lot of times they just get more workload with the same pay. So I think it will be very uh, helpful when we're thinking about equity to bring that question too. Just a suggestion. Another thing is, uh, is, is another question about uh, landlord. Uh, there was mentioned that there is easier application process. And I'd like to hear more about like, how um, how is that? Is it easier language? Uh, is it less questions, more accessible to all landlords? Uh, could you expand on what an easier application process looks like. Great, so I don't know, Vahid, do you want to hit on the first piece around like whether that's part of the, the analysis you're doing at that front end negotiation around pay differential and yes. then we'll go to the landlord question? Yeah. Yes, it is. It is, okay. So, you know, we can building off that model for uh, your comment, Christina, and then for the landlords, what, what makes it easy, I think is really the yeah. essence of the question. Yeah, so uh, what we have done is together with HDC, we take a look at the um, forms that they require for filing a claim. And so right now they're in the process of making it kind of like a web form. So it's uh, user friendly, there is, it's not super complicated. Right now it is um, kind of like an, an Excel format while they kind of build that and get that going, but we didn't want to hold up any landlords or any claims by saying, no, wait, you know, until we have this other part, like if there's claims that need to be done, um, then they can get going on that. But we do take a look at the language and make sure, even when we did the FAQs, just to really go through the language and make sure that it's not super technical. Um, because if you work in the housing world, I always say housing has its own language. And so if you work in the housing world, you're familiar with that language, but if you're a smaller landlord that doesn't necessarily have or has dealt a lot with vouchers and county and you know all that good stuff, um, then they don't necessarily know what that is. So we 
We are considered of that um, when we work with HDC and when we're going through the form. So that's one of the ways right now that they're really trying to make it um, more user friendly is to turn it into like a web format. And then is that in multiple languages? That was a follow up question in the chat. Yes. Yes, it is. It will be. It will be. Will yes. be. Once okay. we have yeah. the forms completed, then we can work on having those translated. Go yeah. Ahead. And the nice thing is that right now, um, because it's kind of just getting off the ground and we're getting started, um, HDC does take the time to talk to the landlords, go through the forms with them, do a lot of like the technical part of it. So it's not like a here's the forms, I'll see you when I see you. They're really involved. And so they really, they were involved, they asked the questions, they involve us, and then we, you know, support the landlord in those ways too. Great, thank you. So, uh, well, let's do a process check. Do you have, if, do you have a question that feels really urgent? So we, I do want to move us on. Are you okay with that? Okay. So there's some follow-up items, I, I think several that, that folks have named, but I think for the most part, what we accomplished here was what was hoped that we'd see um, we'd get a glimpse into some of the work that's happening, but it would also inspire um, our collective minds around how we can take what we learned today and, and, and regionalize it and continue that, that march towards uh, regionalization. That's really in our charge. So I do want to shift to Abby. I mean, we're, it's going to be a little truncated, um, okay. which is okay, but I think there's two kind of goals of what we're going to talk about with the, the equity lens. One is that you're getting some experience just kind of um, uh, getting your hands uh, in it a little bit, and also just getting some initial feedback. So Abby, I'm gonna pass it to you, open it up, and we're gonna do a little bit of exercising. It'll be a little bit short. We'll ask you to just dive right in, um, but I think we'll still be able to take away some stuff. Great, thanks, Ben. Um, so we're talking about an equity tool today for a couple of reasons. One, because Measure 26210 requires a focus on equity, and an equity tool is a really good way to accomplish, accomplish that. The TCPB has specifically requested an equity lens. Um, we'll be using, uh, using an equity lens as a way to put equity and inclusion values into action and uh, to be intentional about weaving equity work into the goals that we're setting and implementing. Um, so an equity lens is uh, a tool used to process and analyze the impact of policies and proposals in underserved and marginalized individuals and groups and once identified, the tool is used to eliminate barriers ahead of implementation. Uh, we will uh, use this tool, the way we will use this tool once uh, it's vetted and good to go is we will include it with our uh, consultants that we hire in support of work towards the TCPP goals. It will be part of their scopes of work and part of what they're trying to achieve in the uh, process of working with us towards these goals. Um, and then the TCPB can, itself can also use the tool as you are getting reports back from cons uh, consultants about the work they're doing. And as you're evaluating the proposals that are brought to you all, you can use that, uh, the tool to help ensure equity in that evaluation process. So with that, um, we're going to run an exercise a small group exercise where we will, uh, as Ben said, use the tool with an example, but the purpose is not to solve the problem at hand, not to fully solve uh, and vet the proposal at hand, but the purpose in this activity is to evaluate the tool itself using this example, and I'll pass it to Ben to uh, kick off the exercise. Yes, yeah, so there's two things happening right now. One, uh, folks in the room, um, we're gonna have you more or less pair and share, although I think Steve, commissioner and counselor will have you be a threesome, um, a triad, whatever the, the language is. Um, and then folks online, um, I'll join you and we'll have a conversation as well. And so what we're gonna ask you to do, and it's gonna be relatively rapid, um, I'll just, preface all this by saying we're going to ask you to have your kind of try on minds um, in place, right? Just try this, right? It's okay to struggle with it. Um, I'll also just acknowledge that um, 
you know, as we think about the lens, right, that it's not like we would spend a lot more time doing this, right, in, in the real world. Um, but we're going to use a scenario where we're asking you to think about one of the, the recommendations that there's a coordinated and supported regional training that's meeting the diverse and individual direct, diverse needs of individual direct service staff with sensitivity to needs of BIPOC agencies. So imagine. Um, you're kind of thinking about that recommendation and trying to ensure that we're considering equity in our analysis. So we're going to break into small groups. We're going to ask you to kind of work through as far as you can get to work through those questions. Again, trying to stay in the analysis, not jumping into action, right? So we're not trying to ask you to come up with solutions. Um, but we'll support you in moving through the, 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 the exercise. So if you all in the room, if you're pairing up, so Monta and Sahan, Zoe, Mercedes, and then Commissioner, Councilor, and, and Steve, um, get just talking amongst yourselves. So Sahan, uh, what do I have you on? Uh, Sahan and Monta, you'll be group four. So you'll be looking at the power questions, okay? Mercedes and Zoe, you'll be group three. You'll be looking at process. Okay. Group two uh, with Steve, uh, Commissioner and Counselor. You'll be looking at the place questions as it relates to um, regional training. And then online, I'm going to join you um, and we're going to talk about people. Okay? So I'm going to ask us just to spend about 10 minutes, struggle as much as you need to. We'll have a couple people in the room that can walk around with you, and I'll, be walk, I'll join the uh, folks online to kind of talk through it. So we'll take about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back, see where we get, report out, and uh, we'll continue the conversation. Then we talk about those. Okay. Is there questions? Dive in. That's what I'm going to say. Don't even ask questions. Just dive in. Um, folks online, I'm going to join you. I'll find a space where... I'm, I'm not, can we not make sure we don't hear us in the room, but I can still hear them online? Is that possible? Yes. Are you good? Yes. Okay, so we'll move the room. I'll, online, folks, I'll see you in a second. Yes, so it's really brief. We want to get too much detail because we're really trying to use it as a tool to evaluate this tool. So you'll have to make some assumptions as you work. Okay. Okay. But these are the questions. Yes. We're your place. All right. Hello, online people. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. So. Um, you can see the question that Ariella put in the chat, but I'll read it. Um, the questions we're going to work through for people thinking about training, right? Who is positively and negatively impacted? Why and how? And that could be who could be, who would be, right? There's some assumptions here, but we want to think about who is the audience that we're talking about in our proposal. How are people differently going to experience that training? Or how are people differently situated in terms of barriers that they might experience, right? What do we have to consider when we develop trainings that would mitigate barriers or what are the type of barriers that might show up? Does this recommendation policy or approach, so what, how or could this training traumatize or re-traumatize people? And then really holding and thinking about what should we be aware of when we think about the physical, spiritual, and emotional and contextual effects? So those are the questions um, broadly. But I'll just open it up. How do, you know, let's just start populating our responses. I'll take some notes. I'm going to try not to jump in, um, but just really want the conversation to unfold. So when I say who, when we think about training, who's, who's positively or negatively impacted by training? Oh, sorry, I missed the training part. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're taking our, rec our, our recommendation language around the regional training and trying to apply it. Never so, mind. isn't the answer everyone? Well, that, so let's break it down, though, right? So, um, if I yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm not quite following, Ben. I apologize. So, who is our audience when we talk about our regional training? Who who are we talking about? Who are we training? Y'all came up with this recommendation, Christina. Um, the service providers. Service providers, yeah. I, I, 
I was thinking more about who are we not serving? Because, so go, go there, yeah. Yeah, I think that um, sometimes there are the programs and it's important for the providers to know and share that information with the community. But um, I think it's important also to invite like community leaders, um, people at the churches, which also are leaders, but uh, they, they reach out to a big audience. Um, for example, I live in the uh, in Troutdale and there is uh, Santani's church, which is like, I was told that um, about a thousand kids did the confirmation with my kids. And I was a thousand kids, that's a lot of kids. And I'm thinking about parents and families. And I'm like, the, thinking like how like the leaders of the church should be uh, learning about this information to pass it on to the community, not only the service providers, because sometimes community members don't go to service providers for many barriers. You can be they're afraid of their documentation status. They don't trust. They don't. There's a language barriers. There's paperwork paperwork barriers. So um, let's invite um, beyond the service providers. Like let's think outside the box. Who is really the ones that are interacting with the community? Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for that. So if we were to think about, to your point, right, if, if so there's two things, Chair Harrington, you said, right, let's think about service providers, right? So that's kind of one target audience. How do we train folks? And then also, I think what I hear from you, Christina, is there's two, there's another group that we should be thinking about is how are we training community leaders, recognizing that many of the folks that are the beneficiaries of trained you know, staff and leaders um, might not be engaged in services. They might find other pathways. So understanding the broader community context helps us try to think about who could be impacted. If that, you came off mute. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> I oh, must okay. have pressed something. <laughs> so what, think about positive and negative impact. How could, how could we ensure that there was positive, positive impact? How might a, a training negatively impact people? Well, Matt? I mean, yeah, I, one of the areas, I, you know, I, I apologize. I know I've raised this in a bunch of meetings, but I just feel so strongly that as, as to the, uh, the issue, and that is uh, the different ways that people learn. Um, and so you know, some of that is cultural. Some of that is our brains are all a little wired a little bit differently um, and so forth. And there's a lot of, um, I mean, just a ton of evidence that the way that you present materials to different audiences uh, makes just a, a, a dramatic difference. I mean, there are people who learn kinetically. There are people who learn by listening, by reading, by you know, doing or whatever. Uh, and then there's also the context in which you explain stuff. Uh, is this a context that this individual will be able to understand? Uh, the example, which was very embarrassing to me, is when I was uh, doing lobbying back in DC on the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, I was meeting with uh, Senator Murkowski's education person about the assessments that we did at NWA and her kid had taken one of them because they had a huge presence in Alaska and said, why are you doing assessments that talk about when a train leaves this town and gets to that town? My people don't know what a train is. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and I, you know, I just turned red. Um, but I, I think it illustrates our risk. If, if we have people um, are, who are in situations where they don't understand the background or the context, okay. or whatever. I won't belabor it anymore. But uh, no, but you're making really you, yeah, you're connecting those pieces. So when we talk about who could be impacted negative, right? If you're in environments that don't have relevant uh, materials, if you're in environments where they're not designed for your way of learning, right? Those are both barriers. Those are negative impacts, right? So you're using some examples. Yep. Um, Michael, you had come off mute. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, sort of. Uh, what Matt was saying on how people learn differently and kind of their level of knowledge as they come through and our different level of expertise. But at the same time, you don't want like 
a thick book or pamphlet that goes through what um, training should be or how it's organized. So I, I think one of our issues we're going to run into is how can we take all these differences and kind of mold it in a way that that um, is easily digestible by the masses and maybe not always think about the one-offs a little bit because at the end of the day we do need to have something that is at the end of the day simple and easy to to implement so i, I think you know the knowledge difference is always going to be one of the the things that i think we'll um we'll, we'll have issues with yeah you're describing the challenge and that's part of the reason why you use a tool like this right what is easily digestible to your point matt might be really ex excluding um, to some folks, right? Um, or doesn't have a range of expertise. Other thoughts on any of the different questions? What about traumatizing or re-traumatizing? Mindy, you're, you're off mute. Oh, I, th I think about it, more of a barrier to think about how to mitigate, but larger agent, presuming the training is beneficial and provides access to other resources and opportunities. Bigger agencies might have the ability to send staff and smaller agencies might not be able to afford it. So thinking through how to provide support for actually participating in the, the event, I think is useful. Yeah, so that could be a capacity issue. It could be a time issue. It could be a fiscal issue, right? Any number of things that um, a caseload issue, right? Um, they, yeah. Any other thoughts? I'm getting the wrap up, wrap up moment. So this was really like a flash in the pan, but... Um, anything coming up for you, um, Nicole? I don't think we heard from you. Anything coming up? Um, just, I guess I'm really reading, you know, what the actual proposal is. And it does seem like it's, you know, specifically training the direct service staff and being sensitive to BIPOC agencies. So I think just really identifying who those agencies and direct service staff are serving to make sure that the equity lens of people is not just including the people providing um, or the training, who the people are being trained, but also who they're being trained about um, and making sure that that is considered in the physical, spiritual, emotional, um, contextual impact in, in that regard that comes right. up. Yeah, and that's... also about, you know, language that might be traumatizing, making sure that there are people with lived experience, if you're specifically talking about houselessness, to be able to vet if any of the content could be activating for people in the training, try to minimize that impact. That's awesome. Yeah, you hit a bunch of stuff there. And, and and I would just add like who is training as well, right? So who's in the room? What's the content? Who's up front? What wisdom and expertise is honored? All those things, right, that that relate. Well, I know we're I'm gonna be transporting back into the other room. I, this was just a really quick example, but the depth of what the conversation just was in what seven, eight, nine minutes, um, really gives you an indication of how complex this can get really quickly, but also how much depth we can get in a, in a really short period of time. So awesome. I know this is a, a little bit of a, a rapid fire and I'm going to walk back into the room. I also wanted to say that awareness of um, how we do the video presentations, like I know for some cultures, like you're not allowed to show your face or, you know, like you have to cover and then on the presentation they get asked like oh um and open your video or show your name or your face so just awareness of like how different ethnic groups are allowed to show up in a virtual space yeah no that's that's really great man man i'm gonna i'm, I'm we're gonna put you back live in the whole room so i'm gonna shut down they're muting me <laughs> all right i was I've, I've been uh i'm being managed by by the staff i was yeah i was being staffed by uh by my <laughs> colleagues well thank you i mean i i think we were just reflecting on kind of the depth of the conversation that we were able to have just in in a really just really quick um, a quick conversation, but also with, with a set of questions that I don't think anybody had even looked at before they walked in, and certainly maybe didn't know the scenario. So 
great job, um, our group. But I did want to ask a, a couple questions coming out of there, and we can kind of open it up, maybe group by group, just what came up for me for you. Um, was there anything that was particularly challenging? Um, and is there any reflection or feedback on either questions that we're missing or things that we want to dive in a little bit deeper um, in the future? So I think we were group one, so can we make sure our folks online are unmuted? And I'd love to open it up and just ask group one that focused on people, um, what came up for you or was there anything that you felt was challenging or questions missing? So I'll just ask uh, my online friends, reflect back for the group. Could you take the questions down so that we can see each other? Oh, I, they're down in my, oh no, they're not down. Okay, there you go. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, sorry, Nicole, yes. Yeah, so, um, there's a request and we'll throw it in the chat for each of the groups, thanks. Any reflections, group one? <laughs> Y'all are just holding the power of the space. Mindy, you look like you're ready to dive in. Oh, I think it was a nice, a good conversation. We explored a couple of different types of barriers and opportunities that if we hadn't slowed down to think about might not have come uh, top of mind. And so I thought it was a nice um, pause. It felt pretty accessible. We all came up with a few examples pretty quickly. Um, around accessibility, learning style, ability to participate in trainings, who is giving the training, um, what language we use, those sorts of things. Good, thank you. Any other um, rapid fire reflections? Who did I say was group two? Who's doing place, was that you? It's us. Yeah, group two, jump in. Sure, so with um, the idea of training place for some of these was easier than others. Um, honestly, the one we struggled the most with was the environmental impact and environmental justice. Although we did come up with um, kind of a takeaway that we should make sure that um, folks doing this work do understand the connection between homelessness and our housing history and environmental justice and how intertwined um, environmental degradation and um, those issues are. In terms of the first questions, um, training lends itself very easily to talking about um, virtual and real life hybrid and all the different accessibility. You know, some people with some disabilities are aided by those technologies and some are hindered. Um, there's a lot of expense on all sides for doing uh, anything hybrid or virtual well. Um, and then also thinking through um, where we do things geographically, um, the push and pull of doing things at the center where it's easy for people to get on transit and get there versus being <coughs> out in the field, um, but also acknowledging the connection to um, service concentration, um, both within the broader region into Portland and within communities um, like in Clackamas County to Oregon City. Um, and then just the idea of training overall, uh, we have this idea that everybody should um, be able to set what they want to get out of a training. We shouldn't, as government, come in and say, uh, you need training, and instead the question should be, how do you want to go up? And using facilitators who can have participants maybe fill out a pre-survey or in other ways define what their own learning goals are. Awesome. Thank you. Any questions missing or anything else that came up for you? Okay. People, place, process, right? Um, so the first thing that came to mind, um, which I'm sure most people know, is that we should probably, we should want our equity lens to inform our proposal, not just spot check our proposal. Mm -hmm. um, in general, the kind of feedback I'm going to share, I think, is trying to make these questions more active, particularly, I think, in the process space. So, for example, in the first one, how are voices of communities of color um, recommend saying, like, which lived experience at advisory groups contributed to this recommendation, identified the problem this recommendation would solve, right? So, like, all of the counties, we have 
dozens and dozens of advisory groups, like there should be somebody who was easy to talk to. And if it wasn't a civic, it could still be like, you know, these organizations, you know, these bodies of work, so that it's not just a how question, but we're actually identifying what inputs. Um, this, the first bullet there about um, how are other affected populations included or excluded, um, that really has to be grounded in the answers to the people questions, so that we're answering that for that group of who, not just any random group of who. Um, around, it, are we, uh, are there empowering processes at every human touch point? We shouldn't use yes or no questions. I also don't know what an empowering process was, but this is another one I think which can be active, which was like, which processes were empowering people at which human touch points? And so then you're, again, you're making like a list, right? Um, again, on the next one around how does the proposal improve a traumatizing process? What traumatizing process? Mm -hmm. So name it, right? Name your inequity is being improved by this and how. Um, same thing for the next one about like how like let's name the root causes, name the racial inequities so that we're really centering our power dynamic. Um, a question that was missing for me, which maybe lives in the who or in the people one is actually who benefits from doing nothing? Mm. Who benefits from status quo? Um, and then in the process, I think again, naming the power dynamic, who decides, who approves, and who can veto and make sure we know who actually holds the power in the decision making as we're asking these process questions. Yeah. And then anything I missed? Anything else, Zoe? That's an awesome There you list. go. <laughs> One thing that I, uh, in terms of, of the, uh, the um, outcome and the result and, and what we want to achieve uh, in training and the people, place, and processes um, is the understanding all the components that we really need to get from all levels of organization. Um, be trauma competent and all the uh, racial inequities and equities from all levels. I attended today, uh, thank you Washington County, a training on trauma informed that really opens my mind as a director of housing who are not on the uh, service and I want my board to attend that. Like I really want everybody on the organization to really be competent on equity and be competent on trauma informed. So everything else, when we are uh, doing policies all the way down to our SHS delivery of things mm. uh, and programs, uh, comes with that lens already because we can do it as a program in a program delivery. But I need the support of everybody else on organizations and. Um, as a whole. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and identify w which voices and um, everything that um, she said. That's great. Thank you. And, and certainly, I, I appreciate y'all connecting kind of the spirit of the questions and the ways that they can be adapted and added, added to um, to become, become more relevant. Um, our power group over there. So first I will say we are the group that discussed the power section of the tool, not the power group. <laughs> okay, okay, good, good clarification, Sahan, all right. Um, so first, just a couple questions that I looked at this and felt like need to be added. One is who created this proposal and why did the HEP body create this proposal? Um, aside from that, we did feel like the questions that we are that are listed in the tool would be able to get us to a place of effectively assessing what are the power dynamics behind whatever proposal it is we're discussing, including the one that was the example for today. But also, the who is going to be probably more important than the tool. Mm. Like no matter how effective a tool we create, we can't make it completely who proof. Um, if we've got a room full of, I want to keep status quo because I benefit from it type folks, um, you could ask all the right questions and come to a completely different answer than the right who might come to. Um, so want to be really cognizant of that, that we, we need to be as effective as we can in creating a tool, but specifically when it comes to power and power dynamics, um, if you've got powerful people already in the room, 
and are not able to see that, then you will get wrong answers to some of the right questions and not get the mm. equity lens evaluation that we're looking for. So we just have to be super careful and cognizant of that. Um, in addition to just the, the two questions that I think help point to that some that I thought were missing with the who created this proposal and why did that body create this proposal? That's great. Monta, anything to add? <laughs> I did it all. No, it. and the who question is, is powerful and, and just naming not just who creates but who participates in this type of exercise, uh, well said. Any last thoughts or thoughts? Are you, you're leading like you want to add something. Well, there's just, on the last, uh, the last question on this portion of the tool is what power are traditional power holders willing to share with partners? And I feel like I would rather see it say something like what power did traditional power holders share with partners rather than willing still to me says you're in power, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's like, hey, did you give us anything? So just some uh, word. word yeah, that changes. also would mean that the people who are in power are the ones in the room answering that question, which yeah. might not always be the best people yeah. to be answering no, that question. Good points. Yeah. Any last thoughts? So great job. Mercedes? You're on mute. <laughs> all, all of their information showed that it was going to have disparate impact, that it was going to negatively impact the very same people that they're not supposed to, and they did it anyway. So I would wonder if there needs to be something in this that draws a line that says, at some point, you can't just mitigate away a problem that you've identified is going to happen. Right? Like, How do we also hold ourselves accountable to say no to a proposal that it just did not meet muster? I won't comment on TriMet board decisions. What I will say is that this, the equity lens is never a, a decision-making tool, right? Um, it informs, it helps you analyze, but at the end of the day, um, I mean, those, those questions you all were answering around, you know, who is the decision-maker, who's accountable to this are really important, but <laughs> this is not something that's going to spit out, this, you know, it's not going to make your decision, so... We'll, we'll have to come back to that in application. Counselor? Uh, bringing up that example, I think it's a good one to kind of break the uh, tool. Maybe it would be important to have who's filling out and who's writing the answers to these questions be explicit at the top. Um, so in terms of authorship, not only authorship, but process in order to get these questions. I, I think that's a, a, a wonderful addition. So for the purposes of today, I think we succeeded in this exercise that we wanted to give a little bit of chance for folks to, to feel it. We wanted to get some initial feedback. And I think as we kind of do our work together, um, you all asked for this, and I think it's part of the process of being able to set some accountability as we bring on contractors, as we have our conversations around this table. So I think to be continued around how we more further embed this into the work that we do collectively and together um, over time. With that, um, we're at 6.02 on my computer clock, even though that one says a little later. Um, our co-chair, Matt, do you want to offer some final thoughts and send us off into the evening? Uh, just extremely briefly, which is that I think this has been an exceptionally productive meeting. And what I believe we are doing, I, I would leave this as kind of something for people to think about. I think that with this meeting and looking forward with a lot of enthusiasm to what we've got coming up, we're now moving from the laying the foundation to actually the work of creating our strategic plan and uh, implementing the kinds of things that we all intend to do. So I just want to express my appreciation to everybody for what I thought was excellent and very constructive and thoughtful participation. And I look forward to next month. Yes, so July 12th, thank you, Matt. July 12th, we'll see uh, folks hopefully in a similar type of configuration, um, but great work. It's 6.03 on my clock. Meeting's adjourned, and enjoy the rest of your evening.